he was right, but what was the emperor's reward for relying upon the assurances of peace which were constantly made to him when the cannon of Vagram was still roaring in our ears? Similar assurances had also preceded that battle, and yet what support had been afforded us, the uncourteous reception given to the proposal for a family alliance, which would have had the effect of drawing close to the ties between both countries, was not calculated to keep up the harmony against reestablishment between them. It had, on the contrary, something insulting in it, which even amongst private individuals would have wounded the honorable feelings of the party who might have experienced the refusal. In other respects, the greater part of the army which had performed in the campaign of 1809 had been removed to Spain or to Holland. There only remained the four divisions which were quartered in the provinces of Hanover, Fulda, Erfurt, ATC, under Marshal Davout's orders. The cavalry was in a still less hostile attitude since, with the exception of the regiments of Caressiers. All the other corps had been reduced to half the numbers for the purpose of completing the skeleton of the cavalry regiments doing duty in Spain. The result of all this was that if the emperor had been again attacked, he would have been found in a similar situation to that 1809. This is no doubt what his enemies desired, but he would have been inexcusable had he allowed himself to begin taken by surprise. Owing to an excessive confidence, the more so when he had to carry on a war in the south of Europe, which might from one moment to another call for supply of 30,000 fresh troops. He had besides no motive for placing himself at the mercy of his enemies. The armaments going forward in France were not to be ascribed to any other cause. Its resources in respect to population were not equal to those of Russia, who could not with any show or reason take umbrage at the raising of such forces as she pretended to have fear of. This calling out of fresh soldiers actually took place. They were almost all intended for Spain. Nevertheless, they were sent to Germany. Father troops were more overdrawn from Spain and sent in that direction. The sequel of these memoirs will afford the solution of the unhappy event above adverted to. The aide de camp of the Emperor of Russia had scarcely reached St. Petersburg when he was sent back to Paris, as if he had merely gone to Russia for the purpose of changing horses. Everyone was astonished at such obstinacy. It was accordingly deemed prudent to watch the movements of that officer and to throw obstacles in his way. Common sense clearly pointed out that he must have had several parts to perform. But his good fortune would have it that instead of meeting with any obstruction, he derived assistance from the very persons whose duty it was to keep an eye upon him. He returned to Paris at a moment when he was supposed to have scarcely arrived in Russia, and he was the bearer of a letter from Alexander to the emperor containing fresh protestations of sincerity, etc., phrases which had been lavished upon us for nearly the last two years, and which on the present occasion in particular were brought and repeated by a messenger who had in his pocket an instruction for carrying on the most ill-managed system of spying that could have been devised. The French administration would have covered itself with ridicule if it had failed to unravel it. It was already six years in existence and had been kept up during Monsieur Fouché's administration, which were the sentiments most entitled to credit. Were they those expressed in the letter of which the aide-de-camp was the bearer, or those which had suggested the instruction delivered to him, and so faithfully carried into effect? There are people who think it natural that the governing powers should make their official intercourse available to the purpose of gleaning information in high quarters. As for that, which is obtained by means of diplomatic envoys. No objection can be raised against it. These are official personages to whom every liberty is permitted because they always possess the means of disguising their real character when circumstances require it. But the aide-de-camp of a sovereign sent direct to him to another sovereign as the bearer of an autographed letter from his master is not provided for by the rules of etiquette and ought the less to adopt the conduct liable to suspicion as every attention was shown to him in private society, in consequence of the steam in which he was understood to be it held. A different conduct towards an individual who is rather a personal envoy than a public charge d'affaires would be a want of attention to his master. It is highly unfair, therefore, to abuse the courtesy shown to the outward character assumed, which is disparaged by the concealed part in reality performed. 
Sovereigns are at liberty to propose similar missions to whomsoever they please, but they have never made the acceptance of those missions obligatory. And a special vocation alone can give the courage to accept them. The emperor did not express any displeasure at the aide de camp's return. He gave him a kind reception and even spoke to him of the series of questions he had put to the teacher of mathematics, saying that such a part had something dishonorable in it, which it ill became him to act and urged him to give it up, otherwise he could no longer receive him. The aide-de-camp, pretending to be greatly affected at so much kindness, promised everything and pleaded for excuse the natural feeling of curiosity to which he had given way in his first journeys. The emperor believed and continued to admit him to his private society, as he had formerly done. The aide-de-camp, who had benefited by his former experience, availed himself with great skill of his free access into society to complain of the coloring which it was pretended to give to his frequent missions to Paris. He alleged that none but evil-minded men could thus entertain the design of injuring him and added some reflections which were calculated to raise him in public estimation. This method fully answered his purpose, and he succeeded so effectually as to obtain the strong commendations and praises of the very minister who should always have kept him at arm's length, and who, instead of having a watchful eye upon his conduct, afforded him the shelter of his protection, so far indeed as to exceed all bounds of discretion. It accidentally happened that on the very day of this young officer's arrival in Paris, there appeared in the papers an article of a rather inflammatory nature which bore directly upon him in respect to the missions entrusted to his charge. That article had not been inserted until previously submitted to the diplomatic censure. Nevertheless, a complaint was made to the emperor of the unbecoming nature of the publication and the ill effect it had produced. How is this, he said, addressing me? You tolerate or rather encourage such publications? You, who in living amongst the Russians have frequently addressed complaints to me respecting certain writings which were much less tinged with bitterness than the one you have been instrumental in circulating? You know how ready they are to take offense. You must therefore be sparing of their feelings, you especially, who are urging me all the day long to make peace, unless perhaps your opinions are changed and you wish to involve me in a war. You know I cannot wish it, being absolutely unprepared for such an event. Lend me, therefore, your assistance to enable me to avoid it. You cannot be of service to me by adopting any other conduct. I plainly saw in what quarter I was to look for the cause of this burst of anger and did not disguise my sentiments from the emperor. My remark only drew upon me a still harsher reprimand. It seemed dictated by a personal animosity, which he surely did not feel for me. I gave way, but first thought it my duty to bring Monsieur Chindichev's conduct to the emperor's recollection. He had, however, been assured beforehand that this officer was a man of the utmost prudence and circumspection, that he felt embarrassed in the world by the public report of the character which had been falsely ascribed to him, and therefore seldom made his appearance in society. I received orders to let him go and come and allow him to see and listen to whatever he pleased. Nothing more was wanting than that I should myself procure information for him. The hint was sufficient for me, but I took care only to close one eye, being aware that my suspicions were well founded and that every effort was made to deceive the emperor who would soon find out his mistake as it actually came to pass a few months afterwards. I had been sharply reprimanded. Monsieur de Champigny was still more roughly handled and lost his portfolio, which was transferred to Monsieur de Bassano. The latter was unquestionably a man of great personal merit, very obliging and diligent in his duties, but he was less calculated for the new functions bestowed upon him than a man just fallen from the clouds. The emperor had promoted soldiers from their ranks to the highest military honors. Nothing was more natural. When an army performed such extraordinary feats, it might well be supposed that real merit was to be found scattered in all its gradations of rank, and no surprise to be felt at the circumstance of marshals of France being taken from a company grenadiers. This was not the case in civil appointments. The merits of the individuals in whom they were vested would be canvassed by a greater number of enlightened men, 
whether they're former colleagues or present rivals. I was not so much the subject of general scrutiny when raised to the Ministry of the Police because I was taken from the army and was less known. So much harm had already been spoken of me that if the tenth part of it were true, I could not fail to verify it in a short time. And public opinion waited for that moment to pass judgment upon me. The only reason of my being sparingly dealt with was that I was justly supposed to be as unchangeable in my duties as in my affections, and that I belonged to no revolutionary party. Monsieur de Bassano was better known. He entered upon a theater to which a series of events had given extraordinary dimensions, and in the career of fortune, this was his first starting point. All recollection was forgotten of the distance performed by military men who had risen to fame in the midst of the perils which encompassed them. But a strict account was kept of every step taken by those who attempted to get the start of their colleagues in the performance of administrative duties. Monsieur de Bassano's progressive advance in the civil career was therefore strictly canvassed. And although he had always rendered faithful services and displayed a remarkable zeal in the performance of them. This is no protection to him against criticism. From that moment, I marked the rise of ungenerous observations, which I would gladly have discountenanced. They were unquestionably calumnious imputations proceeding from evil designing men, but they had the desired effect. No blame ought surely to attach to new families. If Instead of inheriting the glory of their ancestors, they had themselves laid the groundwork for illustrating their posterity. Time alone establishes the distinction between both. In a thousand years hence, history will confound them together. It even, it should not place those of more recent date in the first rank. Certain, however, it is that at the time I speak of the ancient nobility with reference to those of recent creation were compared to old metals, which are esteemed a greater value than the current coin. These obstacles, which were in reality mere trifles, worked with a powerful effect as soon as that position in society had been reached when every species of illusion must be set at work for the purpose of harmonizing with a class of people whose power over public opinion is derived from the antiquity of their renown. And there never was a case in which the proverb that none are prophets in their own country could be more properly applied. The Duke of Bassano had distinguished himself as Secretary of State by his assiduity to business. He had accustomed the emperor to overload him with words and he never allowed anything to fall into a rear. He had a regular classification of what was of the most pressing nature, what demanded early attention, and what admitted of delay. Everything was done with order and unfailing regularity. His zeal in the performance of his duties had naturally secured to him the highest consideration and consequently a powerful influence, but this did not extend beyond the limits of office and afforded him no means of exercising that out-of-door influence, which can only be obtained gradually and by long intercourse with the world. His branch of the ministry, therefore, rather became an office from whence emanated orders to lesser powers than a means of conciliating the greater ones. The crisis of events was approaching. Our foreign affairs required more than ever to be managed by a man already accustomed to direct instead of one who had to acquire a knowledge of them. The practice had long prevailed in the Department for Foreign Affairs and even under Monsieur de Talleyrand of submitting to the emperor the original correspondence of the agents of that ministry he did almost all the work himself even the notes which french agents were to remit to the courts where they acted in an accredited character as this circumstance was well known those notes were considered by the envoys as the equivalent of positive orders to them they accordingly received and transmitted the notes and were thus relieved from the responsibility they would otherwise have incurred had they only received ministerial instructions the development success of which would have been left to their own discretion in their diplomatic capacity this mode of transacting business was attended with another serious inconvenience. The service of the ministry was thereby confined to the duty of keeping the register of correspondence in order and became no longer of any real assistance to the emperor. 
It had become an official practice to affix the name of the sovereign to everything, even to matters of which he could not possess the slightest knowledge. Accordingly, the envoys of inferior foreign courts soon grew tired of a mode of intercourse which shut out all discussion. It was alleged that the Duke of Cador was too inaccessible to them. But much worse was now happening. They hardly ventured any longer to discuss any public business. His loss was felt by all, but Monsieur de Talleyrand was more particularly regretted, for he had the laudable practice of replying to whatever was written to him, and he never held any intercourse with the emperor upon public business, except in an official manner, never mixing up his name with the arguments which he introduced in his letters. Chapter 11, soon after the entrance of Monsieur de Bassano into the Department of Foreign Affairs, the Hans Towns and the small districts of Oldenburg were united to the empire. A general clamor was raised against this measure. The fact of its being called for by the force of events was wholly disregarded or lost sight of, as well as that the continental system for which so many sacrifices had been made became an idle measure if English commerce could pour its produce in those countries and inundate Germany with cotton goods, with articles, the growth of the colonies to which our prohibitory measures refused admittance, it was found more convenient to set up a hue and cry against pretended projects of ambition, a rage for extending and aggrandizing the empire, the dimensions of which were already too great, as if such annexations could ever be considered as definitive in their character, as if it were not obvious to the plainest understanding that they could only be transient measures destined to throw obstacles in the way of foreign industry and to prove to the enemy what he had to expect unless he renounced the unjust pretensions which he held forth as if, in short, they could be viewed otherwise and in the light of additional countries at the disposal of France to be brought forward as a set-off in negotiations for peace. With respect to the district of Oldenburg, Russia, which openly favored English commerce, had just prohibited our own produce. A country had again yielded to the influence of the cabinet of St. James. Her views were now openly declared. There was assuredly no ground for giving a tacit acquiescence to the infractions of the treaty. The emperor was following up the development of his new projects. He was quite as well informed of the augmentation which Russia had given to her armies as she pretended to be of our increasing our own forces how plainly we perceive, he said on the occasion, what the Emperor Alexander might have done to prevent the War of 1809. Now that he fancies he has grounds for personal apprehension, he is not at a loss for means. Under pretense, in fact, of the demand occasioned by the war in which he was engaged against Turkey, and which he was anxious to bring to a close, he had gradually doubled the strength of his armies. All Germany was equally aware of it, and watched the movements of the two cabinets, as it was clearly seen that the armaments of Russia exceeded the demand called for the Turkish war. A restless disposition was beginning to manifest itself on both sides. The emperor did not believe that the Russians would venture to attack him single-handed, but he was apprehensive of such another alliance as that of 1805, which might be attended with more dangerous consequences, as he had less means in readiness to resist it and would have had to contend against a greater number of enemies scattered over a more extensive space of country. He was cautious, therefore, not to accelerate events, but adopted measures of precaution with the greater activity, as he felt it necessary to keep up the confidence which his allies reposed in him. To this clouded aspect of the political horizon is to be ascribed his sending to Spain the troops of the Confederated Princes of Germany and withdrawing in their stead an equal number of French and Polish troops in which he placed the most unbounded reliance, the annexation of the Hans Towns and of the country of Oldenburg to the French Empire trenched too much upon the interests of European powers to admit of their viewing it with indifference. The annexation of Holland was scarcely forgotten when that of Hamburg, Lübeck, and Bremen was announced. We were instantly assailed by a general clamor. Apathy was only shown on those occasions when the English inflicted any injury upon us. The uniformity of sentiments against France could not long remain a secret in the latter country, nor fail to create intense uneasiness. All this augured and approaching war, which was looked forward to with the utmost horror, whilst in this state of agitation, intelligence was received of a protest 
in which the Russians declared that they had taken no part in the late territorial grandizements of France, and especially in the annexations of the Hans towns and the Duchy of Oldenburg, which they formally denounced, declaring at the same time that the Emperor of Russia could never view that act of feelings of indifference. The meaning of this, in words as clear as language could convey, was that we must prepare for war which was as sure to follow their protest as the prick of a pin inflicted in good earnest is a certain prelude to the firing of cannon. And when animosity comes in for a share of the contest, the distance between both extremes is quickly measured. A commercial ukazi had already been issued. As I have above related, which forbade the introduction of any of our produce into Russia, such as champagne, Burgundy and Bordeaux wine, silks, and other articles, while those of English produce, which Alexander had pledged himself to shut out, were thenceforward freely admitted into their harbors, as Russia, in virtue of her alliance with us, was bound to pursue this prohibitory system towards English commerce. The result would necessarily have been that, by now shutting us out, she was depriving herself of all trade. A truly absurd supposition, the power of... An emperor of Russia can never be carried to such an extent as to impose in his country so serious a privation. To believe this would be to form an incorrect estimate of that power. Accordingly, a second ukazi issued in favor of the English commerce soon made its appearance. The emperor Alexander was fully sensible of his necessity, and he was placed in such circumstances as to be compelled either to overlook the infringement of the article of his treaty of alliance with us, by which he had consented to close his ports against the English, to whom he thenceforward allowed free ingress into and egress from his dominions, or to prepare himself for the most serious personal misfortunes by resistance to the general will of his subjects. The Yukazi, therefore, against French commerce was nothing less than a signal of an accommodation between Russia and England, and consequently a signal for the annulling of our mutual alliance. England had just considered that her union with Russia would be a natural consequence of the alliance between France and Austria. We were now at the end of February 1811. Everyone perceived the storm which was gathering the distance and it became a source of general alarm. Commercial transactions which had fallen to the lowest ebb now ceased altogether. The Russian legation exercised the utmost vigilance in every direction. It assumed a pacific tone and was soon beset by some who were attracted by curiosity to know the exact state of affairs and by others who relied upon reverses of fortune without which any change in their condition was hopeless. The aide-de-camp of the Emperor Alexander, who was in Paris and used every exertion to procure statements of our recruiting and of our armaments, these were the political thermometers, which would determine the period of a commencement of operations with the view of making a parade of his zeal and of the proper use he had made of his time. He ascribed to the Emperor Napoleon the intention of sending to Poland all the troops intended for Spain. This was the coloring of his correspondence with his master. He had suffered himself to be imposed upon by those who spread the reports of a contemplated partition of the Russian Empire. He became an instrument which evil designing men laid hold of in Paris and to whom they communicated the most extravagant information, which he nevertheless reported to Russia as positive facts. I, it followed as a natural consequence that the Russians would raise armaments proportioned to those which, according to the information given to the Emperor of Russia, were actually preparing in France. The counter effect of this was soon felt in Paris through the increase in the armaments of the Russians was communicated by the French ambassador at St. Petersburg. This would also give rise to fresh armaments. Thus it was that the presumptuous vanity of one or two young Russians, wholly incompetent to perform the parts which they had assumed, gradually drew to two colossal powers into open conflict. Had the result been fatal to their country, they would have been loaded with the animate version of their fellow countrymen, the contest having terminated against us. They have claims upon their gratitude in exact proportion to the dangers to which they expose themselves. I shall have to return to this subject after relating various circumstances which occurred at the same period. We had reached the month of March 1811. The 
empress, was near her confinement. The public mind was exclusively engaged in calculating the consequence which might attend the birth of a princess or a prince. The latter was wished for with an anxiety which almost checked the hope of such an event. We hope what we wish for, but we almost despair of obtaining it. The birth of a prince was calculated to give a stability to all things which appeared of an uncertain nature. It held out a hope of a termination of the war, which would then be without an object. No revolutionary convulsions would any longer be apprehended because the interests of all would be linked to the same destiny which would thenceforward be firmly secured. Every species of conjecture was formed when... In the evening of the 19th of March, the Empress felt the first pains of labor. The reports soon spread all over Paris because whilst the Arch-Chancellor and Monsieur Regnon de Saint-Jean-d'Angely were sent for their presence being required for the purpose of drawing up the act of the child's birth, the professional men such as Dr. Corvissart and Monsieur Dubois, the surgeon, were summoned to the palace so that in less than an hour the apartments on the ground floor of the Tuileries were filled with upwards of 200 persons of both sexes. The only individuals in the bedroom of the Empress were the Emperor, the Arch-Chancellor, the medical men, the Lady of Honor, and other ladies in attendance. The whole night was passed in a state of anxious expectation. The Duchess of Montebello and Madame de Montesquieu withdrew from time to time in order to communicate intelligence of the state of the Empress, who suffered to such a degree as to excite the alarm of the accoucheur who attended her. He arrived before his colleagues and judging almost immediately that the pains of labor would be extremely severe, he had gone up to the emperor's apartment to communicate the circumstance to him and to request he would come down and send in all haste for Dr. Corvisar. The emperor, who was never alarmed at anything, replied to Mr. Dubois in these words. Why would you have me go down? Is there any danger? Mr. Dubois replied in the negative, but still wished him to be present. The emperor could clearly perceive that Monsieur Dubois had lost his usual presence of mind. He therefore came down to the apartment in order to restore him to that firmness which was so much needed on the occasion. But he first asked if the accident he apprehended was a case hitherto unheard of, to which Monsieur Dubois, having replied that he had known a thousand such, Well then, said the emperor, how did you treat them? Surely I was not present. Then act in this case as you did in the others. Muster up all your courage. Fancy that you are not attending the Empress, but the wife of a citizen of the Rue Saint-Denis. Very well, rejoined Monsieur Dubois, looking steadfastly at the Emperor for a moment. Since your majesty allows me, I will do so. He proceeded from the Emperor downstairs and taking off his coat, set about his work with that firmness which cannot be dispensed with, even where the greatest skill is exerted. It is no doubt owing to Monsieur Dubois' dexterity that the Emperor's son is indebted for the preservation of his life. The Empress was in a state bordering on absolute exhaustion and was only confined at 8 o'clock in the morning after 12 hours of unheard of labor. The birth of the King of Rome was immediately announced in the saloon, and in an instant, the 200 persons who were in waiting hastened to spread the news in every direction. It had been publicly made known several days before that the birth of a princess would be announced by a discharge of 21 pieces of cannon, and that of a prince by 100. Ever since the previous night, the cannon of the invalid were loaded, and the gunners at their posts when the order was set out to them to fire. They fired the 21 discharges leisurely, then allowed a short interval to elapse. In order to keep the people in suspense, they continued a fire of 80 pieces of cannon, which the public impatience greeted by rending in the air with cries of, Long live the Emperor! Paris, in the height of her rejoicing, has never presented so uniform a picture of joy. Although the event happened on a working day, the scene was one of general festivity. A balloon suddenly rose up, carrying into the clouds a car containing the celebrated aerial traveler, Madame Blanchard, with thousands of printed notices of the auspicious news, which by following the direction of the wind, she scattered all over the neighborhoods of Paris. It was also announced by the telegraph, and couriers were sent in those directions where no telegraphic communications were established. Fortune, which had so constantly adhered to us, appeared to crown all her favors on the 20th of March, 1811, by presenting us with an heir to a power which such gigantic efforts had created, and which, in the absence of this child, presented nothing but precipitation.
precipices, precipices to our view, the most sanguine hopes of securing a profound peace were now indulged in. The idea of a war or of any warlike occupation was dismissed from the mind of everyone as being wholly out of the question. The months of April and May were passed in congratulations and court receptions. No infant ever came into the world under auspices more favorable or promising so great a concurrence of the will of everyone for the object of preserving inviolate an inheritance which the non-existence of such a child could alone have broken and sunder. Those who have since insulted his youth were then the most eager in the expression of their wishes for the success of his father and were loud in the protestations of fidelity to him, not one of which could stand the test of misfortunes. Chapter 12. It was in the summer of 1811 that the emperor determined to strike a blow at the pope since the second message brought to him by the bishops had not proved more successful than the first. The obstinacy of this head of the church was so extraordinary that the emperor determined to enter into no farther negotiation with him. He attempted to effect by means of the assembled bishops what he had failed to obtain from their chief. He ordered all the most celebrated theologians to hold the consultation and converse with the bishops who stood highest in public opinion, respecting the danger to which a question exclusively temporal in nature would expose the spiritual affairs of the church. He inquired of each what means could be resorted to for the purpose of adverting a schism of which some indication was already appearing. The clergy of France was generally possessed of a very great merit. The same may be said of the clergy of Italy. The latter, however, always displayed some degree of animosity against the court of Rome. The ecclesiastical commission to whom the emperor had submitted the question advised him to assemble a national council composed of bishops of both countries, to which, after making it acquainted with the existing state of things and with the events immediately preceding it, he should communicate the repeated refusals of the Holy Father to give up points of mere ecclesiastical discipline and lay before it the consequences which had already resulted from a refusal applying the matters quite foreign to the temporal discussions which had arisen between him and the emperor. The commission, in short, advised his making known to the council that it had only been assembled for the purpose of applying remedies to the fatal consequences which were likely to flow from the pope's obstinacy in attempting to confound what was personal to himself as the sovereign of Rome with what was properly to be expected from the spiritual head of the church, it being to be remarked that this church was still in existence and could never be wanting, and that since the head of it persisted in not providing for its exigencies, it was highly important to pass him by and to let him know the motives which had led to the determination of doing without him, independently of the circumstance that this proposal, which was in harmony with the opinion of every enlightened French bishop, was founded in reason. It was also the only remedy calculated for an evil which could not be checked in any other manner. The situation, moreover, was not wholly unexampled in history, where we find a proof that a similar course had been already resorted to. The emperor accordingly determined to assemble a council in Paris. He dispatched through the respective ministries of France and Italy orders of convocation to all the bishops of both countries, pointing out the day on which their presence was expected in Paris. They all attended the summons. Somehow, ever with very uncompromising dispositions, this convocation afforded us opportunity of ascertaining how many Episcopal sees were filled by men of limited understanding who were neither possessed of knowledge nor education, with the exception of a few remaining prelates in the ancient French clergy, which was so celebrated for its mental acquirements, the rest was composed of wretched friars who had attained the prelacy through means of patronage which had succeeded in obtaining the sanction of government to its recommendations at the time of the restoration of public worship when nothing more remote than the idea that those prelates might one day be called upon to act so important a part. Each favorite of power obtained a bishopric for his relative with more facility than he might formerly have obtained a mere curacy. Nothing more was required than priests of a peaceful disposition provided they were of exemplary morals. It mattered little whether they were regular theologians or whether they could only read their breviary. 
This oversight had the effect of encouraging the spread of ignorance because a bishop who was himself uninformed would not suffer in his diocese a priest who might be a contrast with the confined understanding of the superior accordingly when the moment arrived for gathering the fruit of the improvements introduced in France, notwithstanding the influence of a considerable part of the nation, nothing was more reaped than what had actually been sown. This council, which had been convoked in order to attend to the spiritual question, which the Pope refused to detach from the temporal one, ran into a course directly opposed to what it had been attempted to give it. The Italian bishops were alone found to have formed a correct notion of the proposal and to evince an independence of the papal despotism, but the French Bishops, amongst whom were several men of sterling merit, were so carelessly managed that no good resulted from their favorable intentions instead of making them divide the burden with the prelates of narrow and confined ideas for the purpose of enlightening and preserving them from the error into which they fell for want of proper guidance. The consequence was that malevolence, which is ever on the watch, soon found out what had been left undone, sounded the feelings of each, and led into the road of opposition. Those bishops who had only come to Paris with the intention of assisting the emperor and relieving themselves from a situation of the consequences of which they were fully sensible. They had for nearly two years been unceasing in their complaints to the administration respecting the state into which the church had fallen. They had been called upon to afford it relief, and by a strange act of contradiction, they completed its ruin. The devotees of both sexes took upon themselves to manage the prelates. They were careful not to apply to those who followed no other guide than their understanding but secured all the others whose education had been neglected with the exception of the hours when the council was sitting those prelates were sure to be found at the houses of the devotees where they were visited by the messengers of malevolence who presented themselves in the character of angels sent from heaven in order to show them the precipice into which they were about to plunge and to remind them that the vicar of Jesus Christ was detained in captivity and called for all their exertions to restore to the morning church its beloved chief. If the precaution had been taken to publish the previous proceedings of the negotiation with the Pope at Savona, such a course would have been a powerful assistance, the consequence of neglecting. That precaution was that these idle assertions uttered to men incapable of discovering their unsoundness assumed a consistency which no argument was afterwards found adequate to destroy and completely deceived public opinion as to the real object intended for the convocation of the council. That assembly needed to be presided by a man who might have exercised over it the ascendancy of distinguished merit. It was suffered to become a field for the intrigues of all those who felt an anxiety to defeat its real object. Instead of seeking the means of severing the person of the Pope from the affairs of the church, which were exclusively to engross its attention, it was on the contrary engaged in the task of raising up those two questions, which were perfectly distinct. Not a single rational discussion took place at the meeting, which reckoned, however, many men of learning and distinguished talent. But the spirit of mediocrity was for, far outnumbered them, and they were forced to remain silent. The Italian prelates were also prevented from speaking owing to the difference of language. The result of this state of things was that, so far from the emperor having gained any strength to contend with the pope's obstinacy, the pope acquired new strength from the attempted contest. These vexations, which were fomented by the spirit of superstition, generally complained of throughout France, were thus on the point of again exercising their baneful influence, and the seeds of discord were about to spring up anew in every class of society. There would have been imminent danger for the emperor in overlooking this state of things. He then ordered me for the first time to direct my attention to the proceedings of the council with which he had at first enjoined me not to interfere. I had not discovered until now that taking the bishops individually, they manifested the best possible intentions for the public welfare, and even that indifference to the Pope, which they were not called upon to events, I was at a loss to understand how so great a conformity of sentiments should have failed to produce any reasonable determination in the council taken as a body. 
On seeking for the motives of this unaccountable discrepancy, I soon discovered it in the fatal influence exercised over all their colleagues by three or four bishops, who had either shown themselves agitators of discord or too weak-minded to resist participating in that disposition. Certain it is that they were all pointed out by the unanimous voice of their colleagues as the leaders of the opposition. This occurrence is of too recent a date to admit of my entering farther into details without incurring the risk of entailing trouble upon those who have had the courage to bring their underhand intrigues to light. The motives, however, which led to the punishment of four out of twelve members of that assembly who were loudly denounced to me will serve to point out in a general manner what were the opinions of the majority composing it? Suffice it to say that every letter they had written to their grand vicars from the moment of their departure from their respective dioceses until they were removed from Paris had been read, though many of the letters had, by way of precaution, false addresses affixed to them. Some appeared to have adopted a language agreed upon beforehand. The stir which was made in the dioceses after the receipt of their instructions, afforded a clear insight into the sentiments they were endeavoring to inculcate, as therefore the diocese of Ghent, Tournai, Troy, and Toulouse were those from whence the most unfavorable reports were received. The punishment fell upon the titular bishops of those sees. The emperor was the more displeased at the result of the disclosure, as three of them were almoners of his private chapel, and received an annual allowance of 12,000 francs out of his civil list, independently of their episcopal revenues, and that the bishop of Ghent, who had been an emigrant, and once Bishop of Posen in Poland had formerly used every exertion to obtain leave to return to France, and had moreover been one of the first to solicit the honor of personally serving the emperor who refused him none of the favors which he applied for on behalf of his near or remote connections. The kindness he evinced towards him was owing to his respect for the memory of his father, old Marshal de Broglie, who died during the emigration. The emperor was well aware that religion forbade a priest to compound with his conscience, but he also knew that it never enjoined ingratitude as a precept in return for benefits conferred. Those gentlemen might well be satisfied not to go beyond the opinions they had uttered in the council, but in availing themselves of their ministry to propagate errors, they were acting the part of disturbers of the public peace. I received orders to confine them in the castle of Vincennes, which was immediately done. Papers were found upon some, the examination of which afforded no greater information in respect to political matters, except that they had received, read, and circulated the papal bull at instruction, which had occasioned the arrest of Monsieur Destros and of the cardinals. And yet these gentlemen, like all other French bishops, had at the time of their being installed taken the usual oath upon the gospel. At the mass said on the Sunday on which they had been presented to the emperor, this oath was pronounced on bended knee in the imperial chapel and in the emperor's tribune, as well as in the presence of all those who attended the mass at the moment of the gospel being read. The bishop was dressed in his pontificals. He approached the emperor, knelt, and with his hand extended over the gospel, he pronounced the following words in a loud and distinct voice. I swear and promise on the holy gospel obedience to the constitutions of the empire and fidelity to the emperor. I farther swear never to allow in my diocese any doctrine to be taught which shall be contrary to the policy of the state to keep up no correspondence whether of a direct or indirect nature with internal or external enemies and if anything should come to my knowledge relating to the public tranquility i promise to divulge it to the government such was as nearly as i can recollect the oaths taken by old bishops Notwithstanding so positive an engagement, not one of them transmitted the slightest communication on the affairs, the particulars of which were hawked by Monsieur Dastros about the Diocese of Paris, probably not the only one in which the Pope attempted to establish his exclusive authority. Not only did they abstain from making any such communications and left to the police the task of discovering the mischief, but they moreover endeavored to propagate it, thinking no doubt that they were bound to more than mere character neutrality. 
It is painful to have to comment upon the total absence of generous feelings in men who were bound to set an example of tried fidelity for the sake of their diocesans. Such was the conduct of individuals who a few years before were hunted down and banished and afraid of wearing their clerical dress. Such was their gratitude for the protection extended to them by a sovereign who had been under the necessity of exerting his power and personal influence in order to reconcile them to the nation. He had thrown their country open to them restored the ceremonies of public worship and recommended them to the consideration of the people and fine after reinstating them in their spiritual authority he had with the view to meet their temporal expenses augmented the burdens of the nation which had loudly expressed its discontent at that act of benevolence but the clergy is not slow in forgetting None of the bishops retained any recollection of the benefactor to whom they were indebted for the authority of which they made such an improper use, thereby verifying the predictions of the people. The emperor, they said, when he was loading them with favors, will see what kind of people he has to deal with. He judges them by the standard of his elevated mind. He will be deceived in them. He demanded of the four bishops the abdication of their sees and appointed to their dioceses other priests of a more correct feeling who experienced numberless difficulties on taking possession owing to the instructions which were left behind by their predecessors. If the loss of these bishops was attended with political inconveniences, I must however acknowledge that the see of Tournay could not have been filled by anyone less calculated for the dignity of the policy. I cannot even at this moment account for the omission of this corrupt priest to destroy such papers as were found in his residence. He owed this precaution to the persons whom they designated and with whom he kept up a correspondence. It is only out of consideration for their families and myself that I abstain from naming them for an intercourse such as the one regularly maintained by this bishop was not of a character to entitle him to any consideration. He was nothing more than an agent of debauchery and corruption. And the visits which he performed throughout his diocese were a series of Saturnalian orgies. If he has represented himself after the emperor's downfall as a victim of his tyranny, I feel happy at having it in my power to inform him that his dismissal originated in the proofs of his corrupt morals which were found in his desk, in the very drawers where he kept his bulls, containing, amongst other papers, some chapters of the divine office, translated into French verse for the use of the grenadiers and dragoons. Some of Piron's works are not looser in their descriptions. Anyone who might have beheld this man's attitude in society would have readily entrusted an only daughter to his care. And yet... There never was a monster more deserving of divine punishment. When the emperor found, after the arrest of those four bishops, that the assembled council was preparing to start fresh difficulties, instead of removing those already in existence, he determined to dissolve it and to send the bishops back to their respective dioceses. However much he lamented at the same time that an assembly composed of all the dignitaries of the church should have failed to comprehend that he only convoked it to promote his own interests. Some of them previously to the departure lodged in the hands of the minister of public worship a declaration by which they acknowledged that the propositions which had been laid before them did not contain anything contrary to the canons and that they acquiesced in them as far as they were individually concerned. They all successfully signed a similar declaration. It must still be deposited in the archives of the Ministry of Public Worship. This declaration of each of the members of the council separately taken forms a much stronger act than any determination they might have adopted in a general assembly. And as much as no doubt can be entertained that each of them had maturely reflected previously to committing to paper and putting his signature to his opinion. Nevertheless, the Pope remained inflexible. He refused to grant any bulls to the newly elected bishops and continued to keep the public mind in a state of agitation. As far as it was in his power to do so, he was, however, left at Savona and kept isolated by the adoption of measures commensurate with the dangers with which the country had been threatened by the first burst of discontent excited 
not so much by his own acts as by the improper use which was made of his name. The precautions thus resorted to afford an assurance that no farther religious intrigues could spring up except from the interior of France, and that it would then be much less difficult to repress it. Subsequently to the arrest of the Bishop of Ghent, many similar measures were adopted against parish curates in that diocese, as well as in the diocese of Tournai, and as a necessary consequence in the diocese of Mechelen. The archbishop of the latter was far from considering matters in the same light as the other two prelates, but their vicinity had had such a baneful influence over the curates and inferior clergy of the diocese of Mechelen that the greater number were as much the enemies of their metropolitans as of the emperor himself. They exerted their ministry for no other object than to alarm the timorous consciences of the country people and shake their fidelity. All these measures, however, were of an administrative nature and were taken in consequence of information given by the local authorities. The Archbishop of Mechlin has repeatedly interceded with me in behalf of his clergy, and yet those senseless men were impressed with the idea that he was the author of their misfortunes. Chapter 13. The meeting of the council in Paris had sufficiently engaged the public attention to furnish matter for all kinds of conversation and consequently to become the subject of much correspondence, especially on the part of diplomatic envoys. They afforded an opportunity of discovering some intrigues much more deserved of contempt than of serious attention. That, however, which was most calculated to excite astonishment was a little agency of news which the king of Naples had deemed it advantageous to set up in Paris. The more the subject was considered, the less necessity could there be found for that insignificant kingdom being possessed of other means of correspondence and such as its legation afforded. And this conviction made it incumbent to seek for the motive of what was going forward it naturally presented itself. The emperor ordered the minister for foreign affairs to send off all the Neapolitan officers, Frenchmen born, who were attached under various pretenses to the embassy of that country, which he resolved should be reduced to the individuals who were Neapolitans in the strict sense of the word, and who had originally composed it. He had no doubt intimated this arrangement by means of his of official organ, and it was carried into effect notwithstanding the numerous complaints of that crowd of young men who were unwilling to quit Paris. It was in some cases found necessary to use coercive means in order to enforce obedience. Whilst this measure was carrying into effect, the emperor, whose foresight anticipated everything, had received certain complaints from Spain, in consequence of which he directed the arrest of a chamberlain of the king of Naples, who had not left Paris. His directions were obeyed, and an examination took place of the chamberlain's papers, amongst which were found 19 letters in the king of Naples' own handwriting. There could no longer exist any doubt after the perusal of these documents that whether the idea had originated with himself or whether it emanated from the brains of some of the persons in his service at Paris, this prince seriously entertained the hope of succeeding to the emperor in a given case, that of his death, for instance. As the emperor had not any children at this period, the king saw that to succeed to the inheritance he had only to remove his nephews. And he had no had so far deceived himself as to suppose that in the state of things of which he anticipated the occurrence, the nation would not feel any repugnance at enlisting under his banners. In all his letters, he recommended to his chamberlain to have frequent intercourse with Monsieur Fouché, to complain of his having so long neglected him, and to say that he always felt inexpressible pleasure at hearing from him. Most of those letters were dated from 1809, and had been written whilst the emperor was at Vienna and the English had possession of Flushing. I handed the letters to the emperor, who did not open his mind to me respecting them, but ordered the chamberlain to withdraw to the estate he had in France, unless he preferred returning to Naples. The style of that correspondence was no enigma to me. I found the true key to it in the many injunctions it contained, and felt more than ever convinced that the project of succeeding to the emperor was deeply rooted in the mind of the king of Naples who had never relinquished it until the birth of the king of Rome. 
I entertain the impress impression that his obstinacy in assisting upon retaining about the person of his ambassador in Paris a host of gallant youths, all military men, was nothing more than a precaution on his part for the purpose of attaining correct information of the personal dispositions of the individuals holding high employments of those concurrences he would have stood in need of if the event had come to pass which was the previous condition to carrying his views into effect. I also explained to myself the reason of his having taken so much umbrage at my nomination to the Ministry of Police. He was apprehensive of my discovering that of which he compelled me to take cognizance. For whatever were my private opinions on the subject, I had never before attended to it. He was apprehensive of my finding something of importance among Mr. Fouché's papers, and it occurred to my mind that my predecessor had consigned a part of the papers of his closet to the flames with the view of burying those intrigues into oblivion. The emperor, however, did not fail to remark that Monsieur Fouché had never spoken to him of the correspondence of the king of Naples, nor of his object, which could not be doubted by any reasonable mind after reading the contents of that prince's letters to his chamberlain. When this chamberlain was set at liberty, I ordered that the 19 letters written to him by the king of Naples should be deposited in the archives of the police, unless they were burnt in the month of February 1813. They are probably still in the same place. The discovery explained to me several petty underhand dealings, which I had formerly considered as mere idle talk but which were afterwards viewed in a much more serious light. Nothing should be held in the light of trifles in matters of police superintendents. The smallest trifles often lead to the most important consequences whenever great events are brought about. Otherwise, and step by step, they always fail unless there should be a total want of vigilance on the part of the police. These affairs were hardly blown over when the emperor undertook a journey to Holland, in which he was accompanied by the empress, who was perfectly restored to health. He proceeded from Paris to Antwerp, from thence to Amsterdam and Rotterdam, and returned along the banks of the Rhine, after he had seen in Holland whatever was calculated to gratify his insatiable desire of personally inquiring into everything. This journey presented to an attentive observer many objects worthy of exciting his interest. The lower classes amongst the Dutch displayed some enthusiasm on the emperors appearing among them. The rich did not much regret the annexation of the country to France. Congress alone was absolutely at a stand. At for Holland, this is an object of serious consideration. Commercial people view all state questions with perfect indifference, provided they throw no obstacles in the way of their operations. It little matters to them who has, is at the head of the government, since they have always been their own burden to bear in the present system. It was obvious to the commercial class and so long as the system remained unchanged it was necessary to give up navigating the seas the most grievous of all sacrifices but as there was no possibility of evading it it became necessary to bear even with a good grace so severe an affliction i could only repeat in this chapter what i have already stated respecting the annexation of holland 